Namaste, good evening, and salam alaikum, dear friends and members. It is really an honor and privilege today for today's session, which is on COVID-19 and its impact on the heart. We have none other than Dr. World famous Dr. Naresh Trehan. It is an honor and privilege, Dr. Trehan, for IBPC and me to welcome you for the today's session. Thank Dr. You. Trehan, welcome, sir. Dr. Trehan is the chairman and managing director of uh, Medanta Medicity in uh, Gurugram, which is a 1,500 bed super specialty hospital. He is also the chief cardiac surgeon uh, for the hospital. Prior to that, Dr. Trehan has been credited with setting, establishing and uh, supporting establishment of escorts between 1987 and uh, 2007. He trained and uh, practiced and worked at uh, New York University Medical Center from 1971 to 1987. He is the recipient of Padma Shri and Padma Bhushan. He is worldwide known. I don't want to speak too much about him because you have read and we have been hearing about it since a very, very long time. So, Dr. Trehan, uh, thank you very much for accepting and joining uh, today's uh, session. I'm sure the members are going to really uh, enjoy and uh, learn a bit more uh, about a heart, matters of the heart, I should say. I also welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Rajesh Mittal, who is our uh, committee member from Education and Healthcare Focus Group, he will take the evening forward. So, without much ado, I would pass on to Dr. Rajesh Mittal. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mr. Sinha. It's always been a pleasure working with you alongside, and you are an excellent host, excellent convener. You have always done all the events, and it is on your initiation that we are here today, this evening. And I cannot express my joy and honor and gratitude to have our great uh, Dr. Narish Trehan sahab with us today and to deliver his thoughts and to enlighten us to our members who are so keen to hear from him. So without wasting much time, sir, I invite you to present your side of the story about COVID's impact on heart and especially what's the situation in India and what should we take home from here. Most welcome, sir. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. Salaam alaikum. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be associated with this uh, evening. And uh, I am grateful for all the nice things that you have said. Basically, all of you are well versed and totally educated about the fact that where the corona came from, what may be the origin of it, there is still a little bit of doubt about it, in the sense that we don't know whether it was man-made or it was really uh, from the wet markets. But anyway, that mystery may hopefully will get solved one day. But what it has done is that this little bugger who we can't see has brought the whole world down to its knees. And where we are going is still uncharted territory. The two couple of facts that I would like to tell you about is the fact that different countries did different things and had different results. Whereas India, in its wisdom, the uh, sort of lockdown early, that was in mid or little uh, third week of March, and it, it helped us in many ways. And uh, you know, there's sometimes there are controversies of, of whether it should have been done, what economic misery it has caused, but I'll put it in perspective for you the way I see it. So the first thing it did was that it gave us enough time to actually buttress our healthcare delivery system, where we did not have enough hospital beds ready to or understood how we'd have, have to use, uh, use them for COVID patients. We did not have enough intensive care units. We did not have enough ventilators. We didn't know what PPEs were. We didn't know what N95 masks were in, in its seriousness. And everything was dependent on these, the things that I mentioned were from China. Ventilators, PPEs, 
and the N95s. But in this period, our own Indian industry repurposed their factories to produce ventilators, PPEs, uh, N95 masks, so that today I can say with confidence we have no dependence on China for all these three vital things that we would have we would have required if today if this a lockdown had not happened. So that is one big advantage: infrastructure and supplies. Second big advantage is that today, because we have had the benefit of the experience of countries like US, like Italy, like Germany, that we know what the pathophysiology of the disease is. We understand it much better today than we did then. So now if you, and what effect is going to have as we go downstream, I should also elaborate on that. The third thing is that newer and newer pharmaceuticals have come along the way to give us hope that we can reduce the morbidity and mortality from this disease. So starting off, and you may know all this, but I, I just need it as a starting point. You know the deadly part of this virus is the spike, the S protein that forms the shell, which you see the pictures all the time. And what it does is once it enters the nasopharyngeal system, it sits there and multiplies and actually hooks up with the ACE2 receptor, which is part of our body, which is our regulator of all our blood pressure, kidney function and stuff like that. It maintains the, the, the normal balance. So the virus goes, the spike goes and enters the port of the ACE inhibitor and couples with it. Once it couples, it starts multiplying. So this is where the first observation came. We, you know, in Madanta had the first people, those are the 14 Italians who traveled to India as a group and then developed the symptoms and developed full-blown COVID disease. This was the first known group in India. They were sent to us by the government and we had that opportunity of studying them early to understand the disease what and how it was behaving itself. So knowing that this, this spike actually couples itself with the ACE inhibitor, we observed that out of the 14 Italians, 11 were on statins, like Lipitor or Atorovastat statin. And they, their recovery pattern was much faster than the three who were not. And the other two recovered very well and one who was a 78 year old lady unfortunately succumbed she was a heart patient she had diabetes she was 78 years old and arthritis so she was a, a sitting duck for this disease anyway so that hint came that okay if the ACE2 inhibitor is blocked possibly in individuals who are on, on statins for a period of time that they may have the first hint of protection against the virus multiplying that rapidly. That was one. Second thing we understood was that once the multiplication takes place, it actually descends into the lungs. And we felt, and all of us felt, that it is the destruction of the lung tissue which actually makes the person hypoxic. And that's the cause of death. Well, that belief was went on till, thank God, the Italians actually did a, in Bergamo, against the WHO advice, did 50 autopsies contiguously in patients who had died from COVID and discovered, which is something which is still help, really helping the world today, is the fact that they noticed that there was less destruction of the lung tissue by the virus but that the inflammatory response to the attack by the virus had actually unleashed that cytokine storm which created huge inflammation in, the, in all the tissues including the arteries and the arterioles that come to the lung through which the oxygen was to exchange and those got thrombosed by the inflammation. That's why there was a block to transfer oxygen into the blood. So that is, gave us the second 
uh, idea of what could be the end of this disease, why people die from it. Along the way, you have the multiplication of the virus and the fact that how to stop the cytokine storm. So there becomes four parts. One is people who are maybe already on the uh, on statins may benefit a little bit. Second, we discovered in our own patients and in thousands of patients today that hydroxychloroquine given early in the very first sign or even to people who, as prophylaxis who, of uh, healthcare givers who are on the front line of the COVID war, if we gave it to them as a prophylaxis, it seemed to help. Now, the studies that were done by ICMR actually have conclusively shown that there is definitely a lower incidence of uh, COVID infections in people who were actually taking the prophylactic doses while they were taking care of COVID patients in the wards. So that is the other thing that we believe because India is so familiar and genetically we may be engineered different than the West, but chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, which has been around in India for many years, has been consumed in zillions of doses, has not really had any major side effect unless people who have pre-existing heart disease by way of QT interval being longer. So, let's rest hydroxychloroquine. Then comes the point that the virus is multiplying inside you rapidly and you then have to deal with that any antiviral drug that we can find may be effective. So that's where there are two drugs right now which are leading. One is remdesivir, which you've all heard of. Remdesivir has, a, a, has been actually being manufactured in India now and very soon will be available at a reasonable cost to our patients. So that's an antiviral and the attempt is to reduce the viral load. So, so then the Japanese drug, Fabirapi, is just been approved yesterday and that may, is the other frontline antiviral drug which may be helping to reduce the viral load in the middle of the disease. The important part of this use of antivirals is not to wait till the patient is getting sick. Sick is one, is the early signs are on a CT scan that you can detect patches on the lung. That to me is the earliest sign. That may happen even before the PO2 starts dropping because for PO, SPO2 to start dropping, you need enough damage to the lungs. So if the earliest detection that you find that the, the virus has started affecting the lungs, that's the time to use antivirals. They are the most effective and the, the results of the studies are showing right now that it shortens the disease length. So from maybe 11 days to six, seven days, by three, four days, it may improve. And also maybe there is a 10 to 20% in, in the reduction in death rate. That is not conclusive yet. There are enough studies going on, which will tell us in the next few weeks. So with the use of antivirals, we may reduce the viral load. Now we get to the next step, and that is the inflammatory response of the body to the virus or the, in, the body's response is measured by certain factors like IL-6, which you can measure in the blood. Now, if you see the, the anti-inflammatory levels going up, then you need to get into drugs like dexamethasone or, or, or drugs like PCZ, which we are using to reduce the inflammatory response of the body. So in, in order to abort the cytokine storm, which is a natural phenomena, if you are going to have a, uh, a, 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 a business in the sense of if you're going to get that cytokine storm, it will work havoc throughout your lungs, on your heart and your kidneys and liver and, other, and your brain. So that's where the heart disease comes in. We know that when inflammation starts, it can affect the heart. And like the subject of this evening is heart, so I will concentrate more on it. So you have a person who has no pre-existing heart disease. The danger to that person 
from from this problem will be that they they get myocarditis as you know myocarditis is, a, is it happens with many viruses but covid is 19 is a very potent virus it can it unleashes the immune system much more than some of the previous viruses so we see now patients who get the rejection fraction which may be normal before they get the disease it starts dropping and they may go as low as as 30 25 30% the second thing we see which is a marker for the inflammation is the troponin levels go up now the degree of myocarditis and the degree of troponin levels have a correlation and the ones who get severe myocarditis have three times the chance of dying than those people who did not get myocarditis so what is the treatment again the suppression of the of the immune response and that is dexamethasone and tcz those are the two we are using right now second patients who have already existing heart disease so because of the inflammation the arteries will thrombose also along with it so if you have a stent if you have previous coronary artery disease then the chances of coronary thrombosis happening go exponentially higher third thing that if there there is a already pre existing low ejection fraction again because of the myocarditis even becoming making it lower or your artery clotting your artery or the 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 uh, total sub blood supply can be reduced because of thrombosis that your risk then goes up even 5 to 7 times higher so this is the implication of different stages of heart disease normal you are still at risk if you already have pre existing by way of stents or myocardial infarction or pre existing the non critical disease it can become critical in this phase so what are we using for that early initiation as soon as we see that the cytokine storm is being unleashed we start people on anticoagulants that's happening so patients are now being treated with antivirals with anti uh, or anti inflammatories and with uh, with the anticoagulants so that is what we have learned now if if this kind of peak had happened two months ago our knowledge of this mechanism the pathophysiology was very limited this we have learned in the last one month also drugs like remdesivir and favipiravir and uh, tcz were not available at that time so if you look at it heart disease other causes of death and 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 if you especially if you have pre existing for a uh, kidney disease then the chances of survival become even less so diabetes is one of the biggest culprits obesity pre existing heart disease pre existing kidney disease pre existing liver disease or neurological disease these are added risks and can exponentially increase the risk from 3 to 3.54% to as high as 15% so that's the summary of the way it affects our body so you that then comes the point when you have a country like india what should you do because it, it, the fortunate part is that 85% of the people will be either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic that means they will go on to recover over a period of 12, 12 to 14 days which is the normal cycle of the virus so in india there has been a a lot of confusion in the sense that which is all over the world but because our population is so large that what should we do with patients who get covid positive should we put them all in a hospital should we put them in the mother facility so we divided it into four segments 
One was people who were coming from overseas because we know that it didn't originate from India. It was all coming from overseas. And in India, it came via the route of Italy, from Germany, from the United States, and Iran. These are the four main areas where Indians were exposed. So what happened is, the first thing was that if anybody is coming and they, are, they don't have any symptoms and they are set, testing negative at that time, put them in 14 days of quarantine. So the quarantine would continue and if they got symptomatic, again tested, if they then at the end of 14 days, if they, if they tested negative, they could be sent. Then comes the point that if somebody tested positive, but asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic, should we put them in a hospital or not? And as the numbers were growing, we knew that there would not be enough healthcare, uh, I mean, hospitals available, and it was costly to be in a hospital. So then isolation facilities were developed. So today, many, many hotels have been requisitioned to become isolation facilities, and one hospital or the other. Is we have been asked to actually manage them so that the patients can be isolated there, but they don't need to be requiring oxygen or any intensive care unit. So that's what, like for Medanta, we have adopted a hotel known as Red Fox, which is about 10 minutes away from us, and we manage the patients over there who can be monitored remotely. So that is one safe way of keeping them. The other thing is that if they start showing deterioration in their oxygenation or cough, fever, which makes us feel that they are getting now more symptomatic, we move them into the hospital. And then the criteria to move them to intensive care unit are all well established. So that journey is okay. Now what happens is that there is a worldwide tendency uh, sort of varying to the fact that why do we need to keep them in isolation facilities in an organized facility? Could they not isolate themselves at home? So the home isolation program was started and where we remotely monitor these patients. And recently there has been a lot of controversy over that. We are going through it right now because there have been conflicting orders from the government. The basic thing is that places like Delhi and Mumbai and Chennai have had an outburst. So to contain that, we are trying to find the reasons, what could be the reasons why this is spreading so fast. So what the question was, if we are sending people home to isolate and they don't have enough facilities or they're not actually very careful, then they could be infecting the other family members. So should we stop that and put them everybody into a hotel or should we, what should we do? So this is going around because first the order came that nobody goes home. You first go to a corner, to isolation facility, there you'll be checked out. And after five, six days, if you're stable, you could go home if you have the facilities at home. That was, but then we realized that there are so many patient people who are in home quarantine right now, that if all of them were brought into the hotels, there are not enough hotel rooms, so the order has been modified today. So there is a little bit of settling we have to do as a, as a city, as a country, to find out how to cope with these burgeoning numbers, which are like actually climbing quite rapidly. So we are 300,000 plus, uh, and uh, you know the death rate is also going up exponentially. So right now is what we expected, what we feared is happening. So now let's go over to the human and economic problems. So you all have seen the labor which got trapped in this whole thing. The problem was that the clampdown came or lockdown came suddenly. Then the labor force, which is migrants from different states, was trapped here. The prime minister had actually appealed to the employers and a large number were in the, in the factories, a large number were, the, were there in the construction industry to please take care of them.
but they, nobody expected that this lockdown will go on for three months. So what happened was that most people were taken care of for the first month, but then the industry was slowed down and everybody ran out of money. So the industrialists also found it difficult to actually keep it going. So that's why misery started. And these people also wanted to get home because they were away from their, from their families and there were children and all. So there was a huge sort of human misery that we had to go through, which was, uh, you know, which was actually now it's okay. They've reached their, uh, their destinations and we don't know what's going to happen. How much disease did they carry over there? So that's the other question. Right now, we are actually struggling to open up and bring back the economy on its feet. It's going to be a long haul. Lots of people have actually lost a lot of money, including hospitals, because we were told don't do elective work, just do COVID work and the hospitals were empty. Uh, we have very high fixed costs, like our, our wage cost is above 50% of all hospitals. We did not want to let our people go because we have to be prepared for this kind of thing. And so we have kept them alive. We have borrowed money. So the, the private healthcare system is also under stress right now. But I'm sure we'll survive. It's a matter of a month or two more. What is good, I would like to tell you, is that most healthcare frontline workers have actually dedicated themselves. They are not panicked. They have. They are. They are actually serving the patients, which was one of the one of the fears that existed. That will will healthcare workers bolt because of their own safety? But that has not happened. Although enough healthcare workers have got infected, but not very large numbers. But still enough that to spread some fear in all of us. But still, people are at their job. No matter what, they are taking care of patients, which is a very very good an encouraging sign for our country. So that's where we are at. Now you take India's condition. Well, India had not only COVID, two cyclones, locust attack, and now our, our best friends, Chinese, at us. So India is going through a rough period, but the spirit is not, actually the spirit is still high. I think that we are, we are rallying around, and I think we'll be okay, but tough times for the next two, three months. So I'll stop there. If you have any questions um, uh, or anything that you want me to elaborate, I can go on for a, for a few more hours. But in a nutshell, I've shared what what I thought was was relevant. Thank you very much, uh, sir. It's uh, been an excellent uh, 360 degree view of uh, the COVID as a disease and its impact on several sectors in different ways. Uh, I would just, uh, uh, in two minutes, I will just uh, bring and highlight the points which you have raised about the impact of COVID on heart. So for the audience and for everybody, once again, that uh, COVID infection, uh, where the heart is concerned, it affects in two ways, direct as well as indirect. So direct is mostly in the lungs, but it can also affect the heart. But mostly heart implications are indirect because of the inflammation, the various chemicals formed in the body, and they lead to more thrombosis, more clotting inside the arteries. They create more uh, failures, heart pumping failures, and damage to the heart muscles. So these are the ways, and uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Triansar has uh, elaborated on the various stages of treatment from prevention, where hydroxychloroquine may be an effective agent, and then real anti-viral uh, drugs. Some of them have been proven effective and they are saving lives. And as a third stage to tackle the inflammatory part by giving steroids like dexamethasone, but all at a very carefully approached way and approach setting. And the last but not least in the heart setting is the blood thinning medications, what we call anticoagulants, because the various chemicals which are formed as a result of infection lead to thrombus formation, more heart attacks, more embolisms, what we call them. So this is generally a view. Now, our audiences are mostly having uh, two main queries. Is it affecting the normal people also in the case of heart? So Dr. Triyansa said, yes, it can. 
by the various inflammatory responses as well as by the direct uh, damage but more so those who are already deceased have a much higher uh, chance and much higher incidence as well as worse prognosis as compared to the people who have who are de novo who have not yet suffered and who were not suffering from the heart disease before so here we have some questions from the audience uh, one gentleman is asking uh, what is the level of risk for persons who have B, who has bp condition and under control with medication so should he be worried should he do anything extra so your view sir so so the general rule of course is that if your bp is controlled and it has not done any chronic damage to your kidney or your heart then your risk is not really that much elevated the basic thing is it's the combination of hypertension and its comorbidities that will be your determining factor good to say that the way to stay safe is your immune system that's your only personal defense so one of the traps that lockdowns happen make do is that people can't leave their home they are very anxious mentally kind of overburdened because of not only because of the fear of the disease but also the economic burden the fear for your family all that stuff keeps accumulating and we we also believe that you know this stress also causes the hypertension and depression which also reduces the immune system of the body so if your immune system is not in the best of shape your risk will go up so the way to do, avoid it uh, uh, to keep your immune system going is is exercise especially building muscle muscle is immunity so if you are if, no matter what you do you need to do three things one is to say your general health and body structure should be strong second what we are saying is that this enters to the nose and throat and then stays there for 2 3 days to multiply so there is a common belief and i i practice it myself that i gargle with salt water twice a day and you do it thoroughly and whatever mucus there may be or if there is any virus in there it will it will hopefully get diluted the second thing is that if it goes into your lungs that your lungs have to be stronger and should not be affected by any pv uh, uh, sort of pre existing uh, secretions in your lungs so the pranayam exercises of yoga is the second best defense and alom vilom kapal bharti and basirika are the three asanas of pranayam which will help you to keep your lungs absolutely clean so these are the things you have done for your own defense nutrition is very important at this stage so nutrition means low carb but high in protein because protein will build muscle in and and then give you immunity so that's the other other thing that you need to do for yourself then there are many home remedies uh, like you know somebody has tulsi leaf somebody has haldi not against any of those things that if it It, at least it has good placebo effect it makes you feel stronger vitamin c 500 mg twice a day is recommended vitamin d 2000 uh, micro units per day but you you can have one pill for a month that is 60000 units so you should these are the little little things that you can add on it gives you some, we believe it gives you some immunity and also mentally give you the strength to feel or what we call the placebo effect that you are actually doing something which may help mm -hmm. you so i think exercise if you can do 45 minutes continuously that's perfect breathing exercises and that the of yoga you that will also keep your lungs clean and also calm you down and nutrition these are the three things that you can do for yourself so yes. i think hypertension also responds to exercise and 
and uh, the pranayama. So you can, it actually keeps it under control. So these are the things you can do, not only for hypertension, but in, in general situations. In the same go, what is advice for chronic smokers and current smokers? Obviously, we know their lungs are already damaged to some extent. Are they more vulnerable? Or yes. And will they get any benefit if they stop smoking even now? Definitely. See what happens. There are several kinds of damages. The so one is caused by smoking is basically the tar which actually accumulates in your alveoli and actually creates basically blockages. So that if you look at, if you smoke long enough and you have enough tar in your alveoli, which is the end pocket of the lung, you will, your, your resting oxygenation will be less and response to your, your deep breathing and exercise will be less also. So your reserves are gone. So that's why it's only logical that it will require a less number of viruses to affect your lungs because your lung capacity is already compromised by your chronic smoke. Then it will also compromise by asthma because asthma, you know, causes this spasm in the, in the airways and which also accumulates the secretions in there, which makes it fertile, fertile ground for the virus to multiply and then, like I said, it unleash the cytokine stop. So, there is a definite clear, like people who've had TB, people who've had cancer, there's a very clear correlation between the risk to their, those people's lives, like I said, three times that of a person who does not have this. So, 3% versus 11% is what, what has been done there is a study in New England Journal which actually has documented all this. Uh, so, you know, over 8,000 patients were studied and all these comorbidities came out very distinctly that they do increase the risk exponentially. That's true. So, all the smokers should be very careful as well as they should stop and hold smoking at least for Yeah, the smoking period. because yeah. if you keep irritating your lungs on a daily basis, yes. they'll never recover. If you stop, yes and you do the breathing exercises, you can flush out all the accumulated mm -hmm. secretions and maybe a little bit of tar also, but it will help. It may not be 100%, but it will help you definitely. So, sir, uh, in the same go, because you touched upon the uh, tuberculosis part, there's a lot of, uh, you know, publicity about the advantage of having been given a BCG inoculation before. Do you believe in this theory? Are we safer as compared to others? I would very much like to believe that theory, but it's not holding very good for India. See, the theory came from Portugal and Spain. In Portugal, they vaccinate with BCG. In Spain, they do not. And then they found that Spain, the, the disease went so rapidly and the number of deaths also were high. Whereas Portugal, which is right across the border, they share a border, that they, the, uh, the spread of the disease was limited and the deaths were also limited. So people started wondering whether, what could be the factors and that's where BCG came into life. But we were hoping that BCG will help, extreme heat will help, our immunity from our spices and the haldi and all that we did, but I don't think it's working anyway because it's <laughs> really following the pattern that we expected. So if we are, the amount we are testing today, and we have 300,000 plus positive patients, we probably have two, three times more. We all know that. Uh, so we, it, you know, plus our population is so huge. The only advantage we have is that two, twofold. One, our population is young, so proportionally, we will be our numbers of deaths will be less. But the other thing is that our older people, they are not in 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 homes where you know, like in the Western population, where they are in, in old people's homes and all that, where they may get exposed and then a whole bunch of them will get it and and very high mortality. Whereas our we still have that family structure intact where our older people are still at home and children are taking care of them. 
and there has been enough TV information to tell them how to take care of and be be extra careful with the elderly. Then I think that our uh, mortality of the older people may be less than the Western one because we have a lot of uh, support system in our country. Yeah, so interesting. No? So, uh, one question is actually a combination of uh, several questions in different ways many members have asked. So people who are already deceased, like they have suffered a myocardial infarction, a heart attack before, diabetics, hypertensives, but very well treated. Currently absolutely fine taking their medications, diabetes is controlled, blood pressure is controlled, cardiac parameters and markers are controlled. Are they still at a higher risk or not? Or should they be really worried? It's a very, 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 very good question. So you see what, what happened is, if you look disease by disease, diabetes, a well-controlled diabetes or diabetic will suffer less damage, but does not mean will not suffer damage. Okay. Diabetes is something that it's like you put a oxygen on a flame burner and the flame will, work, will burn faster because of the oxygen. A, diabetes is almost something like that in the sense that the cell, because of the high sugar, will burn faster. And that damage will continue to accumulate inside you. Sir. So that's why you can never be too careful with diabetes. And, and, and so if it is so well controlled that your peaks, postperennial peaks are also under control, that's the best chance you have, you have as a diabetic. Right. <coughs> diabetic with obesity is a double vanity. Hmm. So if you control your obesity and you're, you're well controlled, you know, what's the definition of healthy? So like I said, if your muscle mass is good, your fat content is not more than 10% out of range, and you are an exerciser and a non-smoker, then you can say you have neutralized as much as you can the effect of diabetes. Now, if you have diabetes and hypertension, or pre-existing heart disease, then your disadvantage keeps increasing. And if you have, say, atherosclerosis, your coronaries will not had a stent or a bypass, but your coronaries are 60% already blocked. Naturally, the trauma will be, may precipitate a myocardial infarction in that person. So the disadvantages will stay. And in other words, I would say, don't be, become complacent because you think that everything in you is under control. The fact that you have history of all these things makes you more vulnerable and just be that much more careful. That's all. And how do you become careful? That's the whole, whole thing. You know, uh, yes. what careful means is mentally you are. Now, that means I'll give you the story of masking. Masking is not something, and there's been too much controversy over it. Masking is not something which was pulled out of the air. There was an early study done that if you have one person who is infected and the other person who is not infected and they are within three feet of each other and they have a contact of more than 15 minutes, then the chances of the non-infective or un uninfected person becoming infected is high. However, if the person who is infected is wearing a mask, and that person who is not infected is within three feet and the contact is 15 minutes or more, then the, those high chance becomes very middle level chance. And if both of them are wearing a mask and they are still within three feet and the contact is more than 15 minutes, then the chances become low. So if you extrapolate from them, you say both of them wear a mask, the distance becomes more than three feet, hopefully six feet. And the contact with one that person is not continuous for 15 minutes or more, then the chances of, ex of actually catching it become less. Now, what happens? People say, okay, we, we, we are, there is help coming from outside. 
you don't know what their history is you don't know who they are exposed to the only way to neutralize it mask them before they come into the house hand hygiene before they come into the house so if you do all these things that's the best carefulness you can have don't socialize even if you meet people do not come within 6 feet of each other and and wear a mask if you that that would be extra protection but if you is a known family member and you know you don't have to wear a mask but you keep your distance that's those are the things you can do to be careful because there are very very uh, uh, sort of subtle ways of catching the disease we don't know where it comes from many people don't know it spreads in the community but as a person you can protect yourself by these three things that i told you about hand hygiene masking and distancing that's true so next is a concern and query i would say and these are again two related questions one after the other one gentleman asked should everybody take aspirin even though he is not suffering from heart attack or heart problem the existing heart problem will it be indicated or will it be useful for everybody to take aspirin for adults in the hope that it may reduce the chance of covid impact on the heart and the second is should all patients who are covid positive be started with anticoagulation blood thinning medication very early in the in the disease even though all other parameters are good so these are the two related questions well they are very very good good questions uh, so the question first to take it the aspirin part so antiplatelets may play a role definitely we we worry that people who have got heart stents and stuff like that that they may get clumping of platelets in spite of antiplatelets so there is no harm from that point of view a small dose 75 mg of aspirin is not going to hurt you it may help you no question about that and the second part second question that you asked was about uh, uh, anti blood thinning anticoagulations yes anticoagulants see what is the danger of these things if supposing you have a breakdown in your gi tract which also you know it affects the gi tract also and you may bleed so unnecessarily taking anticoagulants at an inappropriate stage may put you at a little higher risk of bleeding than you want to see but when you are faced with a with a, with the rising inflammatory markers most definitely you should be anticoagulated so i don't think that there is you you take uh, you know everything you take in the first go you the, the, the same logic is there's no point in taking dexamethasone unless we have evidence of inflammation because then it will weaken your response also yes so th that is why each one has its own downside so it, i i think that the marker is aspirin 75 mg will not hurt you anticoagulation may hurt you dexamethasone mo will most definitely hurt you if you are not in that in primary state so right. be careful that you don't self medicate yourself because what we are going to use as doctors at a different stage of the disease should not be taken as a prophylaxis so that's that's very valid point and uh, at each stage a different approach and medication may be may be indicated and required uh, there there is a question from a doctor who's a very practicing senior doctor so it is very specific question but still i'll put it up that have you used ecmo the uh, membrane oxygenator have you used in any of the covid patients and uh, what is your experience if at all in your center we haven't we haven't yet although we use we use a lot for for lung failure and for heart, heart lung failure we have not had the need right now okay and i'll tell you why if there is failure because of a reason that the cardiovascular system can will need support and the lung system and the ventilatory system we can need need uh, support and you believe that there is still room for recovery then by all means it should be used no question in my mind okay in the same way like in any other indication for ecmo yeah no so what what is no you know for pulmonary failure we use it all the yes. time yes but the point is are you going to hurt more than help 
in this situation is something yes. that we, the right timing is important. Yes. So, if we see that in spite of doing all the measures, somebody is not recovering. So, what will be the criteria? You have a 50-year-old person who has healthy kidneys, liver, kidney, heart, brain, everything is okay, his lungs are okay, but now is overwhelmed by the disease. He's the candidate for ECMO. No question. You have an 80-year-old person who has hmm. all the chronic factors, the chances of recovery are almost zero on ECMO. So it's not worth worth the putting the patient through the pain and the resources, exhausting the resources in that situation. Yes. So today, if you ask me, in our experience, where we have a, today in our hospital, we have 66 patients in ICU. Oh. And out of them, 30, 38 are on ventilator, which is a very high proportion because being Vedanta, being a tertiary, I mean, super, super specialty, last stop, people are be coming in when they are not being able to handle in other hospitals, they are, they are being shipped to us. It's a very high proportion of ventilated patients, mm. but our loss has only been in patients who are either multi-organ failure or above the age of 80. So we have not used it today, although we are ready. It's living, we have enough uh, ECMOs in the hospital because we have a very busy cardiac and, and, uh, and okay. pulmonary service. Yes. So we are there, we'll, be, we'll use it at the first, but then today we have not had the opportunity or the need for it. Yeah, so, uh, sir, uh, I would also request you to elaborate on the use of AC inhibitors in the RBs, the blood pressure medications, because there was a lot of confusion in the beginning, which as if they would be harming, then it came, they might be helping. When it says it, there's no, no, no clear effect and you should continue. So all people want to know that is it safe to take these antihypertensives, blood pressure medications? Okay, so this, this is, you know, AC, Basically, inhibitors, yes. H2 inhibitors. That's, yes, that's yes, sir. And, yes, sir. And, and that's where the key lies. Now, if you look at the study that was published in New England Journal of Medicine, that correlation did not happen. So, they did, it does not hurt. Okay. So, from that point of view, there is some clarification on that, that neither helped on, nor hurt. So, but there is a, a very large study also in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is more an observational study uh, on 30,000 patients, which did give an indicator that statins seem to be helping. Yes. So, you know, that's a, these are, I mean, should yes. we start, start popping statins? No harm, you can have statins because if, if they are block, blocking the port of the ACE2 inhibitor uh, or uh, receptor, why not? And if if it's if that's the real mechanism of dock, docking of the virus to the ACE2 inhibitor, and the block may help, it may help to reduce the multiplication of of viruses. But it is not proven in large numbers yet. But if, if we did a study, prospective study, and use it over statin, maybe it would work. But then they say you have to be using it for long periods of time or enough number of times for this to to block enough receptors. So yeah. Those are the gray areas which will, which yes. will go forward. So, uh, so there is a, there is one question from a very senior colleague and member. Is it safe to go to hospitals or hotels where Corona patients have been kept? And what is a safe period by when they are safe to use? If you are, are you asking the question, if you are COVID positive, is it safe to go to these places or you are COVID negative and no. is it safe to go? COVID, COVID negative. It depends yeah. on hospital to hospital. Yes. So if there are hospitals where they do not have, they cannot segregate the two areas, then it's better to avoid them. Fortunately, say a hospital like ours, we have two separate blocks which can be totally sealed off from the other. So we don't have any problems. We are doing our regular work, surgeries and all that stuff. And we have not had a single... COVID positive in those because we test them before they come in for elective surgery and every patient is tested and we have not had any problems so far, which is a great thing. But if you have floors which are intermingled with COVID, then you can have a problem. So if, 
the, the, the main question that is uh, to be addressed here is people who need treatment who are non-COVID, should they wait? Because that's one of the reasons why we, we have said, encourage that COVID should be totally separate from non-COVID, that many people have lost their lives waiting. So many MIs have happened. People who were cancer patients who were required to have therapy could not come because of the lockdown. So many, many a lot of tragedy has happened. So right now, anybody who needs a, you know, something like a cardiac treatment, cancer treatment, kidney, liver, all that stuff should not wait. If it's a normal hernia or something, it can wait for two, three, four weeks, no harm in waiting. So it depends. Now, gallbladders, normal gallbladders have become septic and then you have to rush them in. Yeah, those kind of things have happened. But it depends on case to case. And the best thing to do, like we are doing hundreds of tele concerts now, uh, over video, okay. over tele-concerts. Yes. So always consult your physician and see, and go to the hospitals which have total segregation of COVID and non-COVID. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I think we are uh, very much obligated to respect your time, sir. So would you like to make a final comment? So the then next question which is, which is yeah. hanging in everybody's mind is, will yes. there be a second wave? Yes. What is the danger of a second wave? So that is more a question than, a, and than an answer anybody can give. But certainly, I don't think we should let our guard down for some time to come. Because the next three months after it goes down are always critical for a resurgence. So each country will have to make its own policies. But I think that a, in the back of our mind, Social distancing and even masking in situations where you're going in crowds may be the order of the day, what we call the new normal. So in, in no handshakes, always greet each other with the traditional <laughs> salam alaikum or namaste, which is even better than, than going close and hugging people and stuff like that. And no kissing right now. Okay. Okay, so, sir. So thank you so much. I have to go. But I, I enjoyed myself. I don't know if you did or not. But yes, really. Another day we can do a live session in Dubai. Or, you know. Not yes, welcome, sir. So yeah, two minutes, uh, last two minutes, yeah. uh, we will hold you back. Uh, first of all, uh, I will thank you so much from my side. And it's really a wonderful session. And thanks to all the audience who raised very pertinent questions. Certain questions I did not take up and could not take up. And some of them are actually very general questions, which you have already answered in the in your presentation. Before. So if there, is, if there is any special question that you want me to yes. answer, just email it to me. Yeah, I'll be very happy to answer. So, uh, sir, most of the things you have elaborated and answered, most of these, are the, only the question format is different, but answers have already been there in your presentation and this is recorded, so it will be circulated to all the audience. But audience oh. here have also been wonderful and they have raised very pertinent questions. So in the last, yeah, uh, I will invite uh, Mr. Dilip. So, <laughs> yeah. Mr. Dilip uh, will... Yeah, thank you, Dr. Trehan. I know you have to go, but it's been a wonderful evening. Surely all members have enjoyed. And we really look forward. Uh, the day is not far. Hopefully, day should not be far off when we can invite you here live with us. It's a, it's a prestigious business uh, pro, uh, and professional organization. So thank you. And thank you, Dr. Mittal, for... Thank you, uh, Dr. Trehan, uh, with us. Thank okay. you, sir. And thank you, Stay all members. Well. Stay safe. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. That was